Let's get started. So today, as we all know, um, we're here for the thesis defense of Jaehoon Sol. And um, before he starts, I want to say a few words about him. So Jaehoon has been in the lab since 2008, yes. right? Um, and he's finishing, his, he's defending today. Uh, fortunately, he's staying here for um, another year, at least, as a postdoc. Um, so many of you know him uh, because uh, Jaehoon is actually, um, in addition to the work you'll hear about what he's, where he's kind of doing methodology development, he's probably like the best, perhaps the best collaborator um, that our lab has ever had. And many of the people at UCLA will be very sad to see him go for that reason. Um, he's been very productive. He's published, I think, 12 or 13 papers in his PhD. Um, and I think six of them are first author. Uh, very recently at a, a co-authored paper uh, that's coming out in science. He um, has some, he has many, uh, like, many really good papers, good methods that he'll be talking about. Um, he is probably, um, he's been my TA for three years. So that's going to be a major <laughs> loss for me. <laughs> and so if you missed, if you didn't take my class yet, I would, you know, at least wait another year to take it. <laughs> um, and, I, you know, he's going to be, uh, it's, it's really great uh, honor to have him. Um, in my lab for so long. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. So today, uh, and thank you for coming to my defense. Today, I will, uh, I will discuss the research projects that I've been working on during my PhD. And the title of my talk is Design of Efficient and Statistically Powerful Approaches for Human Genetics. So first, let me go over some basics of genetics. So all of our genetic information is stored in DNA. And you can think of the DNA as a series of 3 billion letters, where each letter is A, C, T, G. And humans differ by about 0.1% of their DNA. And these differences are called genetic variants. And most of the genetic variants are what's called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. There is the single, single base change or single nucleotide change. So here is sequence of another individual. And the position where one indi individual has A and the other individual has T is a SNP. And we have about 10 million SNPs in our human genome. And we are all different because of these genetic variants, such as SNPs. And some, some SNPs may cause people to have different types of hair. So in this example, the person who has a G earlier has curly hair, while a person who has C earlier has straight hair. And more importantly, some SNPs may cause people to have certain type of, certain type of diseases more easily than others. So the main question is, how can we find these genetic variants or SNPs that cause these differences in traits or in di diseases? And this is very important to find the roles of genetics in traits and di di diseases. And one way? is to perform association study. So here is how association study works. So we first collect individuals with a disease, and they are called cases. And we also collect people without a disease, and they are controls. And we need to obtain their <coughs> information on genetic information. And one way is to use this genotyping kit. And we obtain their SNP information here. And let's say for this, for this SNP, Let's assume that 80% of cases have C alleles and 10% of controls have a C alleles. So it means that there's difference in allele frequency. <coughs> and in other words, this SNP is correlated with disease status because people who have a C alleles are more likely to have a disease. So in association study, we compute the correlation or association statistic between SNP and a disease. So this association statistic is based on earlier frequency difference between case and control. And if the correlation is above a certain threshold, then we say SNP is associated with the disease. But out of this, this many 10 million SNPs, how do we choose which SNP to test in the association study? And we have a very simple solution, which is testing as many SNPs in the genome as, as possible. And this is called genome-wide association studies. So GWAS collect many SNPs, like 1 million over the whole genome, and it computes the correlation between SNP and disease. And then it finds SNPs whose correlations are above a certain threshold. 
This, this plot is called Manhattan plot. X axis is the position of SNPs. Y axis is the strength of the correlation. A peak in the plot means that there is a strong correlation or <coughs> association between SNP and a disease. And researchers have conducted many GWAS on many different traits. And results of more than 1,600 GWASs have been published over the past decade. And there are many challenges and problems in GWAS. And numerous algorithms or statistical approaches have been developed to solve the problems in GWAS. And those, in, a, in order for them to be practical, they must meet two requirements. The first is that they must be efficient enough to handle large generic or GWAS data set. So GWAS collect, typically collect thousands or tens of thousands of individuals on millions of SNPs, and they collect it more and more. For example, these GWAS have the largest sample size among the current GWAS. And as you can see, this, this uh, GWAS collected 126,000 individuals. This GWAS collected 250,000 individuals. And this GWAS collected about 200,000 individuals. So the GWAS data is pretty large. And moreover, sequencing technology that ident identify all DNA sequences of individual generate enormous amount of data. And here is one example that shows how large genetic data set is. So this is the disk usage of a Hoffman 2 cluster as of September 7th. And Hoffman 2 is the computer cluster at UCLA that has more than 11,000 CPUs. And this shows that out, out of 96 terabytes, these 93 terabytes are being used and the majority of them are related to genetics or bioinformatics. So it shows that genetic data sets are large, and we need an efficient method to handle the large data set. And second, methods must be statistically powerful. So GWAS data are often very expensive to obtain because of the high cost of genotyping or sequencing. This plot shows the cost of sequencing one genome over the past decade. And sequencing cost is decreasing faster than what's called Moore's law. This is the Moore's law. However, it's still too expensive. For example, let's just, even if we assume that it costs $1,000 to sequence one genome, it will cost $10 million to sequence 10,000 samples. And this doesn't include the cost, collect DNA, or trade information, which can be expensive. So we want to <coughs> utilize as much as data possible to detect associations of genetic variants by designing powerful approaches. So during my PhD, I've been working to develop efficient and statistically powerful approaches to solve problems in genetics. And my work can be grouped into three categories. The first category is solving the population structure problem in GWAS. Second category is finding associations of rare variants. And the last category is related to EQTL studies. I list the specific projects that I have done for each category. And since I don't have time to go over all the projects, I will discuss one project for each category. So first, I will go over the efficient approach to correct for population structure in GWAS. So let's suppose that we perform GWAS on certain disease. And we assume no population structure, meaning that case system controls are all from the same population. And this means the difference between case and control is whether they have the disease or not. And usually, number of SNPs causing disease is typically small, like less than 100, compared to the total number of SNPs that we collect, which is like 1 million. So this means that most SNPs are not associated with the disease, so they have low correlations. Only a few disease causing SNPs have high correlations. So this is the result when we don't have population structure. The Manhattan plot shows that there are only a few <coughs> SNPs with high correlations. And this is the QQ plot where x axis is expected p value, y axis is the observed p values. If we assume that there exists no association between most SNPs and disease, the most p values are expect expected to follow this yellow line. And these red dots that deviate from the yellow line are SNPs that are significantly associated with the disease. And as you can see, most SNPs have low correlation, only a few SNPs have high, high correlation. And inflation factor, denoted as lambda, measures how much inflation of statistic exists in the result. So inflation factor should be close to 1 if, if the p-values follow the expected distribution, 
or greater than 1 if they don't. So we want this to be 1. And now let's suppose that we perform GWAS on prostate cancer. And studies have found that African Americans have higher rates of getting this cancer. And this is the table showing the statistics of prostate cancer for different populations. And it shows that African Americans have the highest incidence and death rate. Let's suppose if we collect the cases in control without this information, then we are likely to have a higher proportion of African Americans in cases than in controls because we are likely to have because they have they are they have high rates of getting the disease. So let's assume that 50% of cases are African Americans and the 50% 50 50 of them are white. And let's assume that 20% of controls are African Americans and 80% of them are white. And how does this setting influence the results of GWAS? And it has been known that differences in ancestry cause the populations to have different earlier frequency for many SNPs. So for example, minor earlier frequency of SNP A in white is 0.2, while that in Asian can be 0.5. And even extreme cases, some SNPs only exist in a certain population. And I mentioned that in GWAS, if the SNPs have high earlier frequency difference between case and control, then they have a high correlation with the disease. So the P plus X minus P minus X is high, then they have the high, then they have the high correlation. And disease causing SNPs cause this high earlier frequency difference. And in addition, SNPs that are influenced by the ancestry or SNPs whose minor allele frequency is different between population can also cause this high allele frequency difference. And I'll show why. So here's one example. Let's assume that minor allele frequency of SNP X in African American is 0.8 and that in Y is 0.2. This SNP X <coughs> has different allele frequency due to the difference in ancestry and does not cause prostate cancer. Now let's uh, compute the earlier frequency in cases in controls for SNP X. So in cases it is 0.5, in controls it's 0.32. So the earlier frequency difference is point, uh, 0 0.18, and this is quite large difference. So SNP, so SNP X will have high correlation with the disease. Note that this high correlation is caused by the population structure, or having more African Americans in cases than controls and it's not caused by the disease. And the problem is that there are many SNPs like X that are influenced by its ancestry, so population structure can cause many SNPs to have high correlations. So this is the result when we have population structure. So the Manhattan plot shows that there are many SNPs with high correlations, and p-values, uh, QQ plot shows that p-value considerably deviate from the expected distribution, and lambda value is way greater than one. And it means that there are many false positives. So SNPs that do not influence the disease appear to be correlated with the disease because of population structure. So to solve this problem, we developed a method based on linear mixed model. So we start with a simple linear model that does not consider population structure. So our trade information is encoding Y, our SNP information is encoding X. We then compute the relatedness between every pair of individuals using the SNP data and we call this kinship matrix. And we incorporate this kinship matrix with a linear model. So this variable u takes into account the kinship matrix. So the variable u observes the effect of population structure. It allows to determine the significant SNP independent of generic relatedness. And then the challenge in mixed model is time to estimate the, the variance component, the sigma square g and sigma square e. And we need to estimate this for each SNP. And Kang et al. developed the efficient mixed model association method to estimate them very efficiently. However, this EMA was developed for mouse studies where we usually collect few hundred individuals. However, in human GWAS, we collect thousands of individuals. So the EMA is computationally too expensive for human GWAS. So we make one key assumption, which is that the effect of any SNP on trail is very small. In other words, effect size of SNP is small. And this is valid assumption for most human GWAS because GWAS have found that SNPs, have, SNPs usually have a very small effect. And with this assumption, we estimate the variance components only once 
instead of estimating them perceived. So this method is called MRX, and it vastly increases our run time. So for, for example, for GWAS data set of 5,000 individuals, MR takes 6 years, while MRX takes 6.6 .6 hours. So then we apply our data set to two human GWAS data set. The first is 1966 Northern Finland birth cohort data set, and it has about 5,300 individuals and 300,000 SNPs, and it has 10 quantitative, quantitative traits, such as body mass index and height. The other data set is Welcome Trust Case Control Consortium. It has it collected 13,000 cases, individuals, across seven common diseases, including bipolar disorder and diabetes. And they have 30,000 shared controls. And they have about 400,000 SNPs. This is the result of the NFPC data set. The first column is the phenotype, the height, and the second column is the simple or uncorrected analysis, meaning that we don't have any population structure correction. The third column is the uncorrected analysis after excluding related individuals. The fourth column is principal component analysis using the hun first 100 principal component as covariates to correct for population structure. The last column is our method. This shows that our method outperforms all other methods because its inflation factors are all close to one. This is, these are the QQ plot of p-values and black is the uncorrected, blue is uh, 100 pieces and red is our, uh, our method. So if you look at the bottom QQ plot which is the high phenotype you can see that our method has the least inflation of p-values. And this is the result of WTCCC. And it also, uh, like, uh, similar to NFC data set, our method is better than the other methods as, it, as its inflation factors are close to one. And please note that for these two phenotypes, RA and T1D, we have lambda value sig significantly less than one. And it is because <coughs> And there are many SNPs with large effects for these two phenotypes, and which violate the assumption of MRX. So after re-estimating the variance components by conditioning on SNPs with large effects, our inflation factor becomes too close to one. And there are more results in, <coughs> in our paper, and this paper was published in Nature Genetics in 2010. The second problem that I work on during my PhD is finding associations of rare variants. I work on three different projects for this, related to this problem, and I will discuss the first project, which is the aggregated association test. So GWAS tried to identify variants that are correlated with the disease, and as I mentioned before, we collect case and controls, and we use genotyping arrays to genotype them and obtain their SNP information. And in typical GWAS, we only observe and test common variants, minority frequency greater than 5%, it's because these genotyping kits can only detect common variants, not rare variants. And GWAS have been successful in finding numerous genetic variants associated with many different traits. And this is the published genome-wide associations through December 2012. And please note that they are all common variants. And however, Third seven found that common variants explain only a small fraction of disease heritability, and they have small effects. So study have looked into the have looked into the effects of rare variants, and next generation sequencing allows to detect rare variants. So these are the rare variants. Minority frequency is less than five percent, and study have found that multiple rare variants affect the complex traits and diseases, including cholesterol level, blood pressure, and heart disease. Then the question is, how can you find uh, these rare variants involved in a disease? And one way is to, to use the same technique for finding associations of common variants, which is single marker test. And I mentioned that we compute the only frequency difference between case and controls, and we, will com we compute the p-value. The so larger the difference, the lower the p-value, and more likely the SNP is associated with the disease. But can this method find associations of rare variants? And the answer is probably no, because the single marker test has low power on rare variants. And here's one example. Let's say we have cases and controls, and we count the difference in mutation counts, which is similar to allele frequency difference. So for this rare variant, 
there's only one mutation in cases, zero mutation in controls, so the difference is one. So is this difference statistically significant? Probably not. And we, can, we test next real variant. Again, the difference is one, and it is unlikely to be significant. So this shows that single marker test has low power on rare variants because its power is dependent on the earlier frequency. So to increase the statistical power, we perform what's called group-wise association test. This test groups variants in one gene and asks whether is this gene associated with the disease rather than asking is this gene associated with the disease. And this group-wise association test is more powerful than, uh, more powerful than single marker test because we may observe a larger difference in mutation count. So for example, if we group the variants, the, our difference becomes six. So our method is based on this idea that we compute the difference in mutation counts between case and controls. So here is our, how our method works. So we have three rare variants. For each rare variant, we compute the difference between case and controls. So it is three for rare variant one, two for rare variant two, one for rare variant three. We then weight this difference. We multiply three by 1.5, two by one, one by 0.5, and then we add, we sum all these differences, weighted differences, and our statistic is seven. <coughs> so the reason why we want to assign these weights is because we want, to, we want to increase the statistical power. And the natural question is, what is the optimal weight in terms of statistical power? And we proved that optimal weight requires that we need to know the effect sizes of the variant. So we first developed optimal weighted aggregate statistic, or OWASP, which, assu which assumes that we know the effect sizes. However, it is difficult to know effect sizes, so we assume a digital risk model where rarer variants have higher effect sizes. And with this assumption, we can approximate the optimal weight such that we don't need to know the effect sizes. So the rare variant weighted aggregate statistic is a method with approximate weight. So for OWAS, we need to know the effect sizes. For ROAS, we don't need to know the effect sizes. And this is the result of power simulation. X-axis is the effect sizes of the variant, and they are increasing to the right. Y-axis is the power. So the blue is the power of OWAS, the red is the power of ROAS. Green is the power of MB, which is a method developed by Messner and Browning which we want to compare our power to, and purple, which is the bottom of this line, is the power of single marker test. And this shows that both OWASP and ROWAS have higher power than MB, and power of ROWAS, this red line, is pretty close to power of OWASP, which is the blue line. This means that our approximate weight is pretty close to the optimal weight. And our method can easily incorporate the prior information of variants, where the prior information tells us the probability of variant being functional or causal to a disease. And we denote this probability by CI. This prior information can be useful for weighting variants because we want to assign higher weights to the variants that are more likely to, involve, like to be involved in a disease. And we can obtain this information from bioinformatic tools. And our new weight is simply CI times our original weight. Then we applied ROAS to the mutation screening data of ATM by Tabun Tijarol. So ATM is a susceptibility gene for ataxia telangiectasia. And Tabun Tijarol collected about 2,500 2, cases and 2,200 controls. And they found about 170 rare missense variants. And they used online GBGD and shift to annotate these variants. So online GBGD categorized variants into seven grades from C0 to C65. C0 is most likely neutral, and C65 is most likely deleterious. And I, I, I arbitrarily assign these C, CI values to these seven grades. So we first applied ROAS without prior information. Then we obtained the p-value of 0.3, which is not significant. Then we apply ROAS with prior information. Then our p-value becomes 0.0052 which is significant. This result is consistent with the results of type design error. So this result shows that prior information is useful in group wide association test. And ROAS can detect association in real data. And this paper was published in Genetics in 2011. 
The last topic that I'm going to discuss is EQTL studies. I will discuss statistical approach that detects EQTLs from multiple tissues. So expression consultative trail loci or EQTL studies try to identify genomic locations called EQTLs that regulate expression levels of genes. To detect EQTLs, studies collect two types of information. First, using expression kit or RNA-seq, expression levels of genes are collected, indicated as heat map here. Second, studies collect information on genetic variants, such as SNPs, using the genotyping kit. Then, EQTL study performs statistical tests to compute the correlation between SNP and gene expression to, to detect EQTLs. And linear regression is often used to compute the correlation. And as shown in this equation, gene expression is dependent variable, and SNP is an independent variable. The slope of the regression tells us whether the SNP and gene expression are correlated. If the slope is deviated from zero, then we say they are correlated. And most of EQTL studies have collected uh, gene expression from a single tissue because of a high cost of expression kit. However, least development in microarray uh, reduced the cost, and it is now possible to obtain gene expression from multiple tissues. So as this picture shows, we can obtain gene expression from brain, heart, liver, and spleen. This picture is from the GTEx project, which is a large study that aims to collect gene expression from multiple human tissues. So one straightforward approach to detect EQTLs from multiple tissue is to analyze each tissue separately. So we compute a correlation or p-value between gene expression SNP for each tissue. And if the p-value is significant in any tissue, we say it is an EQTL. We name this tissue by tissue or TBT approach. So in this example, we collect expression, for expression of gene Y from four different tissues. And we compute a correlation between SNP A and expression from each tissue. The results show that SNP A has significant p-value in the cortex tissue, assuming a genome-wide significance level. So it is an EQTL. However, can you detect all EQTLs with this approach? And unfortunately, we cannot because of limited power. The main difficulty in detecting EQTL is power of statistical test. The power of TBT is dependent on sample size on each tissue, and sample size is typically small for EQTL studies. So the limitation on power may cause, SNP, uh, may cause studies to miss EQTLs. So for example, let's assume that SNP B is an EQTL for gene Y in all four tissues. These are the p-values, and none of them reach the genome-wide significance level due to power issue. So we miss the association of SNP B. However, we can do something special with this EQTL, such as SNP B, that has effects in multiple tissues. That is, we can combine results of multiple tissues, and we can increase the statistical power. So in this example, if we combine p-values of four different tissues, then our combined p-value becomes very significant, so that we can detect association of SNP-B. However, the main question is, how can we combine these results or p-values from multiple tissues? This is the main question that we are trying to answer in this research. So the combining p-values from multiple tissue is similar to meta-analysis in GWAS that combines p-values from multiple studies. So meta-analysis in GWAS combines results of several GWAS on the same trait, and it has found many associations that single GWAS did not find. So applying meta-analysis to multiple tissue means that each tissue is each study of GWAS. However, it is not straightforward to apply meta-analysis to multiple tissues because there are some challenges. First, multiple tissue data sets are likely to violate assumption of meta-analysis that studies are independent. Second, it is not known whether EQTLs has effect in all tissues or in a subset of tissues. I will discuss details of these challenges in following slides. So the first challenge is the violation of independent assumption. So meta-analysis in GWAS assumes that studies are independent. It's because it is extremely rare that two different GWAS collect the same individual. However, multi-tissue EQTL studies typically collect multiple tissues from same individuals. And it is problematic for meta-analysis. And here's one example. Let's say we have two mice, 
and collect expression of gene Y from cortex and heart tissues. The first mouse has high expression in cortex, and it is likely that it also has high expression in heart. Similarly, the second mouse that has low expression in cortex is likely to have low expression in heart. So it means the expression is correlated across tissues. And when we compute the correlation or p-value between SNP and gene expression, their statistics are also correlated. So these correlated statistics violate the independent assumption of meta-analysis and may cause false positives. The second challenge is the unknown distribution of EQTL effects. We can categorize EQTLs having effects in multiple tissues into two groups. The first group is EQTLs with no heterogeneity, and it means that it has the same effects in all tissues. So this example shows that this EQTL has positive effects in all three tissues. Another type of EQTL is EQTL with heterogeneity, and it has different effects in multiple tissues. For example, it may have positive effect in cortex, negative effect in heart, and no effect in liver. The challenge is, what's the best approach is to detect all these different types of EQTLs? So to overcome these challenges, we developed a method called meta tissue that combines mixed linear mixed model and meta-analysis. So given multiple tissue data set, we first apply linear mixed model. The reason why we use linear, mo linear mixed model is it allows to incorporate correlation of expression into the linear model. And eventually, linear mixed model allows us to make the effect of SNPs uncorrelated, or in other words, we can make the statistics independent so that we can use the standard meta-analysis method. So this solves our first challenge. And after applying linear mixed model, we apply uh, both fixed effect and random effect models of meta-analysis. Fixed effect model assumes no heterogeneity, and random effect model explicitly models heterogeneity. We utilize both FE and RE to detect EQTLs with and without heterogeneity. So this solves our second challenge. So here is the mess behind our method. So first, in tissue by tissue approach, we fit a linear model for each tissue. So why, here there are three tissues, YTI is expression in tissue I, XTI is genotype in tissue I. In meta tissue mixed model, we combine all these linear models into one model. And the reason why we combine them is we want to estimate the beta statistics here, and then the correlation om among beta statistics due to the correlation of expression. To do that, we add a random effect denoted as U to take into account the correlation of expression. So this random effect U follows the multivariate normal distribution, where mean is 0, variance is sigma square V times D, where D is the matrix representing how samples are shared across tissues. So here I assume there are three tissues and three samples per tissue. The IJ is 1 if I and J are the same individual, 0 otherwise. So given this linear mixed model, we first need to estimate this variance component, and we estimate this using EMMA. And we then apply general light least squares to estimate beta and then the covariance among beta. So covariance among beta gives the correlation among beta due to the correlation of expression, and we generate uncorrelated variance from this. So in other words, we make the statistics independent. So and after obtaining independent statistics from linear mixed model, we apply uh, two standard meta-analysis methods fixed effect model uh, and random effect model. For random effect model, we use a model that our lab recently developed. And it has higher power than traditional random effect model. So these are the results of power simulation. So we simulate four tissues and four scenarios where SNP affects expression levels in a single tissue, in two tissues, in three tissues, and in all four tissues. We measure the power in each scenario and when EQTL has effect in only single tissue, then TBT has higher power than meta tissue because TBT is more powerful to detect tissue-specific EQTLs. However, when EQTLs have effects in multiple tissues, the power of meta tissue is higher than power of TBT. So this shows that we can increase the statistical power to detect EQTLs by combining information from multiple tissues. We then apply meta tissue to multiple tissues from mouse. And there are two data sets. One has four tissues with 50 samples per tissue, and the other has 10 tissues with 22 samples per tissue. 
we collected about 140 SNPs and expression levels of about 10,000 probes. This is the number of EQTLs detected using the genome-wide significance level. The results show that meta tissue detects more EQTLs than TBT. So this is TBT, FNRE. Second, there are many EQTLs with heterogeneity. And it's because meta tissue RE that assumes heterogeneity detects more EQTLs than meta tissue FE that does not consider heterogeneity. Lastly, <laughs> when sample size is small, like the 10 tissue data set, meta tissue can still detect many EQTLs if several tissues are collected, while it is not true for the TBT, whose power is dependent on sample size. And there are more experimental results in our paper, and this paper was pl uh, published in PLUS Genetics this year. So in conclusion, I've been working to develop efficient statistically powerful approaches for these problems, population structure, associations of layer variants, and EQTL studies. And there are many other problems in genetics that require efficient approaches. And as the genetic data, <coughs> size of genetic data is getting bigger every day, I believe that more efficient and powerful approaches will be needed in the near future. And there are many people who supported me during my PhD, and I first I'd like to thank my, all my community members. So I thank Professor Wei Wang, who is a new faculty member in computer science, and she works on computational biology and bioinformatics. <coughs> I wish she could come to UCLA a little earlier so that I could have a chance to work with her. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I really appreciate her being in my committee. And I thank Professor Star Parker, who also does a lot of research on <coughs> bioinformatics and data mining. I really appreciate his uh, uh, <coughs> support and suggestion on my thesis. And it was great, great pleasure to have in my committee. And I'd like to thank Professor Nelson Freimer, who is leading the neurobehavioral genetics and ICNN at UCLA. I've been working with a lot of people from ICNN, and I learned a lot about how real genetic studies are working. And especially, I learned, how, I learned the <coughs> applications out of GWAS, and it has been a great experience to me. And I really appreciate Nelson giving me such opportunities and giving me valuable advice on my research and my career. And lastly, I'd like to thank my advisor, Lisa Eskin. So first, when I came to UCLA, I didn't know anything about genetics or statistics or bioinformatics. So in fact, I didn't know what kind of research I would do in UCLA. And I just was looking for lab to join, and I met Elisa and decided to join his lab. Then since then, he told me everything that I need to know to do the research like genetics, statistics, writing, and especially writing, and then <laughs> how I should do my research. And he gave me really a lot of advice on my career, and I really appreciate his mentorship and help. Thank you, Lisa. Then I'd like to thank my current and former members from our lab. So the top picture is our former members, the bottom picture is our current members. And especially I'd like to thank Boom Han, who is in Harvard Medical School, and Hyun Min Kang, who is in University of Michigan, for their mentorship and their support on my research. And then I'd like to thank all my collaborators and colleagues. And I thank collaborators from my ICNN, especially Professors Giovanni Coppola and Roel Ophoff, who gave me opportunities to work on real GWAS. And then I'd like to thank uh, Professor Aaron Harper from Tel Aviv University, who, who helped me improve my statistics and methods for rare variants. And then lastly, I'd like to thank my family, uh, my wife, Hyun Jung, and my daughter, Hannah. They have been so patient and supportive during my PhD. And I, really, and I, and I, I thank my parents who supported me from my career. Thank you.